Well, hi everyone. Um, I'm today speaking from uh, from a different computer because I am right now in Russia, and um, therefore I am I'm using a slightly different device in order to have a better internet connection. So I'm sorry for the technical complications, um, and I also want to state as a sort of disclaimer that I am in no way a specialist on Russia. So today's lecture. Uh, is going to be more about the general outline of how this whole concept of Russia and the East Russia and the West relations is pretty much introduced to common Russians. So I will be speaking not as a Russia expert, but rather as a Russian myself. Um, and just as I was preparing for this lecture, I, I came across uh, Virginia Woolf's book, A Room of One's Own, which is a magnificent read in itself, and I strongly advise that you read it if you have a chance. And she starts with um, talking about how she was invited to, um, to give a lecture. Um, and the topic she was given was women and fiction. And she writes, the title might mean women and what they are like, or it might mean women and the fiction they write, or it might mean women and the fiction that is written about them, or it might mean that somehow all three are inextricably mixed together. So my lecture sort of raises similar questions. Is it about Russia as the Orient? Or is it about Russia's attitude to the Orient? Or is it Russia as colonizer? Or is it the mixture of the three? Or is it something different? Because the very fact that I think it was Victoria um, who asked in the start of our lecture course, uh, why is Russia in this lecture course altogether, is of course something that needs to be thought about. And of course, having to give this lecture, I was facing this problem throughout the time that I was preparing. So uh, my thoughts today will be really about why Russia ended up being among the Asian or the African or the generally Oriental countries. And of course, what I will be talking about today is very limited because in the course of one lecture, that's the first limitation, there is this time limit, and also the fact that there are so many trends and undercurrents in Russian society today as there were throughout the history of Russia. Um, this means that it's almost impossible to sort of systematize it into a coherent narrative. Another thing that is also important is that when we th speak about Russia, we sort of deal with, with a very large entity consisting of various parts. And geographically, it moved between spaces and between areas. And therefore, it's quite difficult to build it into any kind of coherent narrative. So I apologize in advance for the various fuzzy bits that I will, um, I will sort of uncover in this lecture and leave untied. I will leave a lot of questions unanswered because that's uh, really something beyond my expertise. And that is, I also think that really there are too many things to be stuffed into this one hour. Um, I wanted to show you this short video, but it appears that um, my computer is playing tricks. So you can just Google it yourselves. It's, uh, it's very easy to find on YouTube. A Monty Python bit from the life of Brian. I'm sure many of you have seen it. What have the Romans ever done for us? Um, there is this moment when the uh, people's front of Judea is discussing, if you know the story of the film, I'm sure you many of you do, um, they are discussing what to do and how to attack the Roman oppressors, and they are discussing what have the Romans ever done for us? And there is um, somebody who says, the aqueduct. Oh yeah, the aqueduct, right. Oh, and there are the roads. Well, yeah, the roads, obviously. And the medication, and the sanitation, and the public order. Yeah, but what have the Romans ever done for us apart from all this? And I will leave you to think about this piece, which I have artlessly outlined instead of playing the video. Um, 
I will leave you to ponder which toponyms and which um, which names can be placed instead of the Romans and the us in this sentence. Let this be a sort of thought in the background. So from here, before you come to any conclusions on this uh, matter, I will try to go into my lecture. Uh, the lecture will be um, mostly about three general parts. It will be about the perceptions of Russia in Europe, um, Russia's views of Europe, and it really should be plural, Russia's views of Europe and relations to it, because there were many and they were very diverse. Um, there is also the segment about Russia as empire and therefore the question of what are its colonies and what can be considered its colonies and so on. So these are the three general bits that will be parts of this lecture, but there is very little structure according to this order. Um, I will start with the notion of Moscovy or Muscovy, depending on how you pronounce the word. The thing is, um, as I have started, as I have set out saying, Russian history to us, as it is taught in Russian schools on average, uh, it starts with the Kievan Rus. And I will try to avoid any references to today's uh, policies and diplomatic affairs between Russia and the rest of the world, because this is something, um, you know, to be giving a lecture on Russia in today's moment is quite a challenge, um, especially to people from the Czech Republic. But um, I will try to avoid any political implications because really this is something I hope that will eventually resolve in a peaceful way. So I will try not to go into that. But for Russians at school, we are taught always that the Russian history starts with the Kievan Rus, and the very fact, again, that this is Kievan uh, is, of course, something that raises matters of relations between Ukraine and Russia. Again, something that I'm not going to deal with today. But this brings us to the matter that Russia, as a geographical entity, same as, for example, China, is a very fluid notion because the capitals move, the administrative centers, the economic connections, they all move, change, borders shift. And this raises, of course, the very matter, the very essence of the question that we are discussing here. Where are the geographic affiliations and how are they connected to the notion of the Orient? Um, some parts of, um, so yeah, uh, speaking of Moscovy um, or some, uh, in Russia, it was never called Moscovia. It, uh, it was always either Kievan Rus or then it became Rus and then Russia. Um, so it was, this toponym was not particularly used in Russian history. It's an external notion. So this external notion, this toponym that was used by outsiders to describe Russia, um, was defined by its closeness to the Father Asia, Siberia, China, Mongolia, and even before these lands became very well known, it was something far away, it was something to the east, it was something towards the dark north as well. It was also a land defined by its religion, and naturally it was the Orthodox, um, Eastern Orthodox Church, and therefore it was this Eastern Christianity, which was quite um, a strange phenomenon to this um, whole idea of um, Catholicism and later Protestantism. Can you hear me okay? May I just interrupt myself? Or am I? Yeah, excellent. Okay, because for a second there I had an impression that I was talking to myself here. Excellent. Okay, all good. Um, right, then um, the next bit that is essential is that people looked different, people behaved different. So there were these strange costumes, strange dwellings, strange food, strange habits, 
all of that was alien and strange to any outsider. There was also this very peculiar climate, climate which still is, to a large extent, Russia is traditionally associated with cold, snow, ice, something Nordic, something very, very uh, wild and untamed. And there are generally these vast spaces of unknown, unconquered, wild lands. And this is something of, again, uh, an archetypal uh, part of the perception of Russia in many of the Western sources. Um, Moscovy is also defined by its strange language and alphabet. Having gone for Cyrillic, uh, we have sort of uh, separated ourselves from, from Europe. And of course, this will raise questions in Ukrainians, Belarusians and Serbians and some other nations. But speaking as, um, uh, you know, comparing um, Russian alphabet to Latin, which was and is universal for uh, Europe, of course, it meant that m for many people, automatically, this was something incomprehensible. Same as, for example, in English, there is the phrase, this is something Greek to me. Well, Russian Cyrillic alphabet is also, it looks like something Greek to an outsider who doesn't read Cyrillics. And I'm not speaking about, you know, educated people. I'm speaking about the general perception. This is something, again, exoticizing. And of course, there was the despotic ruler and slave-like subjects, uh, which were, again, the underlying narrative for many of the accounts of travels in Russia. Now, uh, some parts of Russia, or Moscovy, were traditionally closely connected and integrated in economic and political interactions uh, with what today is called Europe. However, the very geography meant that and determined that the trade routes went through the periphery of both today's Russia and today's Europe. So this is like a border between the two, and it was only on this border that the big trade was taking place. Um, and what I have here on the slide are the trade routes, um, and one of them, the, one of the most famous, one of the oldest ones, is the so-called path or route from the Varangians to the Greeks, uh, starting in today's Scandinavia, somewhere around Stockholm, Mo moving through the Baltic, through the Gulf of Finland, into the Ladoga uh, Lake, down through the various rivers, past Novgorod, which was one of the key trade centers of Russia, or what we can call Russia, uh, down through the various rivers and towards Dnieper in Ukraine, today's Ukraine, and then down to the Black Sea towards Greece. Um, this trade route was most active in the 9th and 12th centuries, but similar routes existed uh, at various times. Therefore, many travel accounts were left, most often from the merchants or emissaries, because, of course, there were also emissaries traveling to um, Moscovite Tsar. Foreigners were also present in Russia at different times of its history as advisors, architects, military personnel, and various other technical specialists, apart from the, like I say, the temporary uh, visitors like merchants and emissaries, there were a lot of people who actually lived in Russia on more or less permanent basis. And many of them left a good deal of accounts and travelogues. Uh, and I will um, look at this one, which is quite famous. Um, it was uh, so th this person, Jan Struess, who was born either in 1629 or 30 and who died most probably in 1694, uh, he had a very, very intric um, elaborate biography, I would say. He traveled a lot. He was born in the family of a sail merchant, a sail maker, and he was himself a sail maker. Um, and that was quite a low ranking social position in, in uh, in the Dutch Republic where he was, where he lived. Uh, he was Dutch. And he traveled a lot because he ran away from home. Um, he traveled through a great many countries, 
um, uh, starting from, you know, as I say here, Cabo Verde, Madagascar, Siam, Japan, Russia, Persia, Arabia, and there were many more. Um, and he left accounts. Um, there is a number of questions as to whether or not he wrote them. To begin with, there, are, there exist two marriage certificates from his life. Uh, he was married twice. And in both marriage certificates, his signature is just a J, so he probably wasn't literate, he couldn't write, which means that most likely the texts that he provided were systematized and narrated by a sort of what we would call today a ghostwriter. And there is a whole research on who could this, uh, who could it be, who could this uh, ghostwriter be, uh, but um, it's interesting that this book was published under the title, uh, well, it was titled in Dutch, but I will not be able to pronounce it, so it was called Three Remarkable and Calamitous Travels Through Italy, Greece, Livonia, Moscovy, Tartary, Media, Persia, East India, Japan, and various other districts. And it was published either in 1676 or 1677, and there is even the difficulty with the year, because on the cover right here you can see that it says 1677, but on the next page, it actually says 1676, most probably because the publisher was very eager to produce the text before a rival company produced an account from another traveler about similar travels also in, in Muscovy. So they were quite eager to get ahead. So they were trying to sort of force the publication, but some work was only done and finished in 1677. But this title is interesting in itself. Well, first, it is this mixture of various place names, uh, various uh, geographic locations, which was supposed to attract the reader's attention and fantasy in itself. And you can see that there are, uh, those names are intermixed. It's uh, what we consider Europe, like Italy. It's very far east, like Japan. There is this semi-orient of Livonia, Moscovy, and Tartary, and so on and so forth. So this whole mixture of geographic location was, locations was supposed to inspire the interest in readers because Amsterdam publishers were very much into commercial uh, orientation. They were trying to actually make profit from publication of such books. So they were trying to make it into a bestseller and the publishers also tried to make it very enticing and titillating, including these engravings, and this is one of the engravings, you will, I will show you another one later, but the whole text is um, findable online again. Um, they, they tried to make the name not only lengthy with the toponyms, but there is the subtitle which enumerates the various adventures that the narrator went through in his travels, um, so there is this uh, promise of wild adventure, torture, exotic lands, eyewitness evidence of shocking events, and so on. Um, it's interesting also to note, this is just a side uh, statement, but since the books in the Dutch Republic at the time were sold unbound, the publishers were very eager to show on top, pretty much in a pile, you know, like the, the pile of um, pages, the publishers were very eager to make the cover very attractive so that the um, people start leafing through and so that they can look into this uh, text and be tempted to buy it. Hence the elaborate engravings. So Strauss traveled to Russia twice. The first time was in late 1660s to 1670. And the second time was in 1675 when he accompanied um, the Dutch emissary, the Dutch ambassador, uh, Konrad van Klenk. And uh, before I go into the second travel, I will give you a couple of excerpts, because this is why I want to uh, attract your attention to this fairly famous uh, writing. So, um, he describes in quite some detail what he saw on the way. For example, at the start of the journey, this is still the early part of the Russian journey, 
He writes, by the way, we saw many small villages, but at night came into Kolomna, which was the fairest and best village I had hitherto seen in Moscovia. The inhabitants are reputed wealthy and live in very good fashion. We came pretty early to our stage, having had very good way and reasonable fair weather, so that we had time enough to take a view of the town. Our Pristav or Gid, who spoke good nether Dutch, went with us to show what was worthy of remark, and very courteously resolved us in anything we desired to be satisfied about. So there is this fairly wealthy area, the friendly, relatively friendly people, reasonable weather. So far it's all quite sensible and quite down to earth. It's not exotic as we would expect. Then some time passes and they travel further and it it's, the winter starts, it becomes cold. In the, mean in the meanwhile, it froze very hard and I, with another of our company, went out to ride upon skates, upon which an infinite number of men, women and children, yeah, the priests themselves, came running out to see us. And this is very peculiar because for a person from the Netherlands, from the Dutch Republic, Skating was a perfectly natural activity. There are all those famous uh, paintings where people skate in, in, um, in the Netherlands. Um, and for Russians at this time, this was something that was quite amazing, apparently, judging by this excerpt. Um, so the whole village runs out to see what these strange men are doing. And then they get further into the country, and they arrive in Moscow. On the 19th of January, we brought our baggage aboard a small ship that lay about three miles without Moscow. At this place was the court of the emperor's sister, being a fair place, but of wood, built after a quaint and artificial manner. Here was also the emperor's bear garden, being accidentally when we were there, a great concourse of gentry from Moscow and other places to th see the pastime. And the evening before came the emperor with the whole court and retinue. The theater was only environed with stakes and pails, or poles, that the people might also see that were without. Before they began, were brought out about 200 wolves and bears, and almost twice the number of dogs, all which were drawn in their kennels, set up on sledges. The emperor, the prime of his nobles, sat in a gallery made of, on purpose in a very convenient place to see on every side. So soon as the emperor was set, a sign was given upon which a little wolf and an old bear were turned out loose together, that after they had encountered about half an hour, were parted, which notwithstanding their being in the heat of the fight, were easily brought asunder and led to their kennel. The wolves were afterwards engaged with dogs, of which many lay dead upon the place, and others so wounded that they were no more fit for use. So when they arrive in Moscow, the narrative becomes more exoticized. There, there are these palaces which are made of wood, which according, you know, by the, by the mood of the text, this is something not very high quality, but they are quaint and artificial, they are unusual. And there is also this very cruel and slightly barbaric, or not so slightly, quite barbaric, amusement of wolves and bear baiting. Um, and there are all those bloody scenes further, so there is quite a lot of descriptions like this in the text, um, which kind of shows the, the way a lot of things that were happening in Muscovy or in Russia are perceived as something quite alien and unusual, even though the, the author does mention that his own habits, for example, skating, were perceived as unusual by the locals. So there is this clash of understandings, or maybe not so much, so much a clash, but this difference in understanding what is the normality, what is the normative behavior for each person. Um, the text consists of, um, oh, I didn't look how many chapters there are, but the text consists of three chapter, uh, three parts um, about the three voyages. 
And the third voyage is the one into Muscovia. And here are just some of the titles of the chapters, because pretty much through reading the titles you get the idea of what's happening. Uh, the, the text is fully available and the spelling that I have here on the slides is actually from the, from the way it is reproduced. And the link is here in the bottom. If you're curious, uh, please check it out. Um, so the chapters, I will just um, give some, uh, some examples of these titles. Uh, so the chapters start with the description of how the journeys began. And because it was to Livonia or Liefland, Lieflandia, um, there are descriptions of Liefland. And to us today, the Baltic states are hardly considered to be Orient, or at least to my Russian perception, they are definitely to the West. Um, and yet Liefland or Livonia here is described very much like something, again, exoticized even though it is not quite as unusual and as oriental as Moscovy. Uh, then they arrive in, Mos uh, in, in Moscow itself, and there it, uh, the text gives descriptions of the divisions of the city, um, Kitai Gorod, and then there is the churches, there is the Tsar Gorod, the Skorodom, Strelitsa Sloboda, and the many other parts of the city. There are the various descriptions of churches, monasteries, towers, belfries, etc. Um, it's interesting that he notes, um, Jan Strois uh, notes, that there is the cold climate and diseases, but at the same time he notes how people manage to get a lot of um, harvests and the, the land is quite fertile and there are many animals to be caught in the woods, there is a lot of honey, there is a lot of fur, there is pretty much abundance of resources. Uh, so um, he then goes on to describe the diet, the food that the Russians eat. He points out their great esteem of brandy, naturally, um, their quarreling habits, their women using a lot of painting on their faces, Mar marriages, various traditions and customs, etc., etc. And he also describes the Tsar and um, the way the Tsar is this absolute monarch. And there is a very famous bit from the text where the Tsar at this time was Alexis the Quiet, um, that was already the Romanov dynasty and um, where Strois describes how, in order to show to the foreigners how loyal the boyars or the courtiers to the Tsar are, the Tsar orders one of the courtiers to jump out of the window of a very high tower, which the courtier eagerly does and is later found on the ground dead and is buried with a great solemnity and a lot of um, a lot of compliments to his loyalty. Um, it's hardly uh, provable. At least there are there appear to be no records similar um, to the con in the contents to this one. But the idea that Russian Tsar is the absolute power among his subjects is there. It's very inbred in the text. And then at some point later. Um, Jan Strois becomes engaged in the, uh, in the military service to the locals, so he becomes uh, one of the soldiers, and he is sent to Astrakhan. Astrakhan being one of the cities, one of the very important trade places, trade cities um, to the south, and it has just been um, pacified or conquered. However, so he describes the situation of Astrakhan, the inhabitants, how it became the subject to the Tsar and how the city was actually changed. It changed its location because the original city was pretty much destroyed by the Tsar's um, armies. Um, so the new city was built in the Russian manner because the Astrakhan was actually inhabited by um, Muslim and non-Christian non um, ethnic groups. Um, so he describes what can be found there, um, the former nature of Nagayan Tatars uh, and the various other ethnic groups 
who are there, who eat horse, who drink mare milk and blood, etc., etc. Uh, so we get further into this Tartaria uh, description. But it's very important, Jan Stroy's text became very famous for one chief reason. He became an eyewitness to the very famous uprising. Uh, it was the uprising of Cossacks led by Stenka Razin, and it was one of the very uh, big and very important threats to the Russian government in the 17th century. Um, it happened in 1670, 1671, and um, Jan Stroys got caught because that was exactly the moment when he arrived in Astrakhan that Stenka Razin was besieging the city, uh, so, um, or the township. So there, there is some description of Stenka Razin and his Cossacks and their cruelties in the text written by, um, well, by Jan Stroys or by his ghostwriter. Uh, so in the text, uh, this is one of the engravings, again from the same book that the cover I showed to you. Uh, and this is the moment where Stenka Razin, here he is, is throwing a Persian princess into the waters of Volga River. And this is how it is described in the text. With those words, he, that is Stenka, took her into his arms and threw her into the Volga with all her rich habit and ornaments. Her attire was of rich cloth of gold, richly set out with pearls, diamonds, and other precious stones. The lady was of an angelical countenance and amiable, of a stately carriage of body, and withal excellently well qualified as to her parts, being of singular wit and always pleasing in her demeanor towards him when he was in the heat of fury and yet at last she became the instance of his cruelty. So she sent. It has to be noted that uh, in another version of the same story, uh, it's not the Persian princess, but rather a lady of Tartar origins. Not that anybody cares, but it's interesting that the text uh, by Jan Strois or by his ghostwriter goes into some detail about the, well, about this event and about the way um, there is this general cruelty among Cossacks. So they're this kind of bloody and f fearsome people. Um, and quite soon after this bit is described, um, Stroys's text describes another outrage of uh, Senkarazin. So he writes, his own outrages as to the sin of adultery, he would allow himself, but would not indulge or dispense with it in others. It happened that a certain soldier of the Cossacks had been taken in the action with another's wife. This being made known to Stenko, he caused them both to be instantly apprehended and the men to be thrown into the river with great stones made fast to his neck and heels. But for the adulteress, he provided another punishment, which was to erect a pail on the water side or a pole on the water side and tying her by the feet, caused her to be so dragged along the earth and from the tent to the pole, which was almost two English miles, and there hoisted up where she hung forty-eight hours before she died, and yet nevertheless the great, tor the great torment of which she must needs be sensible, all the time she never was heard to shriek or cry out. So there are those cruelties, murders, unreasonable and unfair judgments, and yet the subjects, or the people who are caught in these turmoils, are not eager to fight against them, so they are kind of submissive. So this description, um, it was very influential, like I say, because it was later uh, published and republished a number of times. And um, the thing is, Jan Strois, um, because he was caught in this siege, he managed to run away, but he ended up being taken prisoner or taken hostage by the Dagestani tribes. And there he was finally bought out by some European emissary. And then he managed to get his freedom, etc. But he never got the salary or he never got the wages for his service to the Tsar as a soldier. So in 1675, which I find adorable, uh, that's the second journey to Russia, as I mentioned. In 1675, he traveled with Van Klenk to Moscovy, to Moscow, once again, to reclaim his salary. And according to some sources, he was paid 
there is apparently no um, no inscription or no information to this end in the Russian archives, but it would seem that at least the claim for this wage was given to the Russian Tsar with the remark, you know, here is a good soldier, he faithfully served you, where are his wages? And this is this classical um, Dutch sensibility, which would of course be quite surprising and strange to let's say, a Russian, according to this orientalistic stereotype of Russia. Um, and this leads us, the, the whole idea of soldiery and Cossacks, it leads us to a number of uh, stereotypes which became embedded in Europe's writings about Russia when it came to the Russian soldiers, because of course there was a number of conflicts and Russian soldiers came to be part of the big narratives. And this is interesting, um, the picture you see is not a Russian soldier, I will explain who that is in a second, but it's interesting that even in the oldest antique tradition of history writing, in Herodotus, there is this juxtaposition of Hellenistic warriors, Hellens, and the barbarians. In other words, there is the juxtaposition of Europe and Asia, and barbarians, if they win, they win not through virtue, but through their multitude, through their physical mass, and through their cowardly cunning when they lure the opponent into traps, where they do some tricks, where they come from behind, etc., etc. So in general, barbarians are the Asiatic or the other warrior. They are this mimetic um, other to the soldiers of Greece and later Rome. So the picture that you see on the left is Sigismund von uh, Herberstein. Um, he was originally from what today is Slovenia, but he was on service in the, uh, to the Habsburgs in the, um, in the Holy Roman Empire. So he wrote notes on Moscovite affairs published in 1549. This is an earlier narrative than Jan Stroys. And it is also quite influential, but he describes slightly different things because he witnessed slightly different things. And he also witnessed some of the, um, some of the fights in which Russian soldiers were engaged. And from his descriptions, this is approximately the description of a Russian soldier. They're multitudinous. They try to fight from afar or from behind. They attack ferociously but can't stand a long fight. They start by creating noise, chaos, and havoc. They are armed with Turkish weapons, and of course a Turkish weapon in the 16th century was pretty much the um, Orient um, par excellence, the Orient. Russian soldiers are good at fist fights, so close fighting, and they try to tire the opponent out. You might note a number of contradictions in this description, but notwithstanding, the, um, leaving those aside, this is approximately the assembly of stereotypes about Russian soldiers that existed in the 16th, 17th centuries Europe. And they, sen they tend to move from one text to another because, of course, there were a great many texts describing Russian life, Russian soldiers, Russian merchants, dealing with Russia, etc., etc. You can substitute the word Russia with Muscovy. Um, it doesn't really change the fact that in many of these narratives, the, uh, the standard representations, which I have outlined before, they sort of moved like nomadic parts from one text to another. And this is quite important in itself because it builds this accumulated knowledge, of course, about a country. And another thing that was very important in um, creating the idea of Russia as a separate entity, as I have already mentioned, was this Orthodox Christianity. And here I will bring a quote from Samuel Huntington. It's not actually a quote, it's just a retelling. But uh, he writes that um, Catholic and Protestant Europe is headed for democracy by the very nature of its existence, whereas the Orthodox Christianity and Islam are more inclined towards dictatorship. And of course, Edward Said, about, him, uh, about whom we are kind of talking throughout this uh, sem uh, semester, 
he objected saying, well, you know, you are sort of determining the whole culture, the whole civilization by one aspect. And of course, Samuel Huntings, Huntington's The Clash of Civilizations was uh, very influential and uh, very much criticized, uh, criticized until this very day. So the Orthodox Christianity meant that there were a great many political, cultural, ideological differences between um, Russia and Orthodox countries, and on the other side, Europe, Catholics, Protestants. And this led to a lot of um, juxtapositions and disagreements, both politically and culturally. However, even Russian Orthodox Church was never quite, or it was at times not quite a unified body. For example, in 1651 and into the 1660s, one of the patriarchs, a very famous patriarch, Nikon, held a number of reforms sort of in response to the um, Reformation in Europe, but more to, the, to, to deal with the problems existing in Russia itself. Patriarch Nikon changed iconography of the icons. He changed, or by his order, um, the texts of um, psalms and hymns were in the in the prayer books were changed um, and of course a, a great deal of believers did not go with this so after these 1660s there was the split between Nikonians or the new believers and the old believers Starabriatsi and these old believers they exist until this very day but they were very heavily repressed. There were religious wars, but they were never called religious wars in Russian history. Um, and it's quite important because these old believers were probably the more reserved, the more um, strong believers, if we can compare the strength of a belief, um, than the new believers, the, the Nikonians. But it was a split again along the lines of which way do we go? Um, I will not go into more detail here because this is again something into religious history and it's a massive subject. But just bear in mind that Orthodox Christianity, even within Russia, is not a solitary body. Until this very day there are all believers and there is a number of other churches which are of course infinitesimally smaller than um, the patriarchal church, but they are still there. And of course, then we come to Peter the Great. And I'm beginning to kind of hurry because I'm running slightly out of time, slowly. Uh, but Peter the Great was the one who, who is like the milestone in the Russian history. Whenever you talk about Russian history, Peter the Great and Catherine the Great are the two big names. And if you actually read uh, the introduction and conclusion to the book that I suggested as the obligatory or uh, reading for this course, um, Skinnel Penning's um, uh, Russian Orientalism, uh, you will have noticed that Peter the Great and Catherine the Great are the two big names in this whole narrative. Peter tried to make Russia a Western country. Uh, the city that I'm in right now, St. Petersburg, was built as the window to Europe. And this is pretty much what we call it until this very day. I'm going to the window, you know, which means I'm going to St. Petersburg. Um, but um, it only, of course, involved the Russian elite. Peasants were left out of these reforms. Foreign knowledge and technology was spread in Russia. And some of the technology, of course, was passed on to the workers, to the laborers because inevitably building ships, building um, all sorts of mechanisms, building manufactures was necessarily the work of uh, what we call today proletariat after Marx. But, you know, the, the low, lower uh, social strata, but the ideological back backing to these reforms was only superficial. It was only on the Russian elite, which was never more than let's say 10% of the Russian population, most probably even considerably less than 10%. The royal family towards later generations became ever more Germanized because, well, Catherine the Great herself was uh, from one of the German uh, dukedoms. 
and then by marrying various Prussian, Austrian, or uh, smaller German um, dukes, princes, um, and other nobility family members, Russian Romanov family was becoming less and less Russian, even though the condition for marrying into Romanov family was, of course, obtaining Christian faith in the Orthodox Christianity and accepting a Russian name and the Romanov surname. But literally by blood, they were becoming more and more Germanized, and this caused a number of difficulties later. In the 18th and 19th century, French language became the key language of elites in Russia. Quite often, noble children would speak French as a native language and would hardly speak Russian or would struggle to speak Russian when dealing with their peasants or with their servants. Um, Russia also copied French fashions, French architecture, French music, French art, French poetry. France was the vogue at the time. Um, it's visible in Russian literature quite clearly where Pushkin half mockingly but half sincerely says that in Eugene Onegin, which is the one very famous poem or uh, novel in verse in Russian, um, which was written in 1825-1832, in Eugene Onegin, uh, the main female character, Tatiana, writes her love letter to Eugene in French. Um, Tolstoy, whose war and peace was the, um, the manifesto of Russianness for the 19th century Russia, um, he mocks this by describing this St. Petersburg salons as imitating the French ones to the very letter. Literally everything has to be done just like in a salon somewhere in France. And this text was much later, it was 1865-1867. Uh, so this whole notion of borrowing from the West becomes omnipresent among the vo vocal, verbal um, elites of Russia. Peasants remained somewhere on the outskirts. And yet it's interesting to note how, for example, in um, uh, 1855, a French author, um, he was, um, I think he was also a, a journalist, um, and he published a book which was called uh, L'Histoire de la saint uh and he wrote this mocking history of the Holy Russia, where one of the, uh, what, at the start of it, um, the legend of how Russians as a nation came to be is told in the way that a polar bear was tempted or was seduced by the uh, watery eyes of a walrus. And the child of this union, and you can see it here on the picture, uh, is this um, bearded baby who became the founder of the Russian nation. So even though Russia was borrowing so very heavily from the French, there was this French counter-narrative um, that, you know, Russians are pretty much animals. But, um, yeah, then came Napoleonic Wars, which rapidly changed the perception of France, Russia's attitude to Europe, and Russia's position in Europe. The cartoon you see here, and I'm sorry that the inscriptions are in Russian, but... So this one, for example, is uh, the Russian frost, the Russian cold. Uh, who is apparently one of the active participants in destroying Napoleon Bonaparte in the War of 1812. And there is, of course, Emperor Alexander I as a crowned bear. There are bears as Cossacks or as soldiers, so the Russian bear army. And there are many other participants, but it's important that the three chief characters in the cartoon are the Frost, the bear, and Napoleon, who was um, kicked. This is a, a British cartoon, obviously, um, from the punch. But it's, it's very interesting how um, Napoleonic Wars changed European perceptions of Russia, only partly, because on the one hand, Russian Emperor Alexander I played a very important part in negotiations of peace, um, 
discussing what to do with Napoleon Bonaparte and um, discussing the future of Europe. But Russia became the sort of the policeman of Europe because Russian monarchy was so terrified of the French Revolution that Russia tried to impose its power over Europe in order to prevent revolutions from happening. And of course, Europe reacted against this. Uh, and when I say Europe, of course, this is a very large um, stretch because Europe was not a solidified uh, monolithic group of nations as it, it is now. Uh, but Napoleonic Wars definitely changed the perceptions on both sides. And this leads us to how Russia was looking at Europe. Um, in the, if, you, if you go into similar periods to what I started with for Europeans, like 16th, 17th century, uh, Russia was often defined in opposition to Nimitz. And this is not only Germany. Um, I don't know how it is in Czech language, maybe you can tell me, but in Russian, the word Nimitz or Nemtsi um, seems to originate, or one of the etymologic explanations appear to be going to the word dumb or numb, you know, a person who is either stupid or voiceless, who cannot speak. And therefore, it's pretty much any foreigner because they don't speak Russian. They, don't, they speak something unintelligible to a local. So they are alien linguistically and religiously, importantly. They don't know our prayers. So defining Russianness against this Nimitz or foreigner was, of course, a natural reaction, especially in the light that foreigners were quite present, including long-term and permanent settlers. I think I've mentioned it before. And there were also among peasants a lot of rumors. For example, there was this rumor that Peter I was supplanted or changed during the European voyage, or maybe even at birth. Um, he was supplanted by a, a Nimitz, a foreigner. And that's why he started this whole great havoc of making Russia Western. And there were similar rumors about Nicholas II and his family, especially his wife, uh, who was indeed not Russian because that was the convention, but also about how they uh, failed to feel themselves part of Russia. Um, and there was this also resentment from not being accepted as equal, because uh, naturally, uh, by trying to borrow from Niemcy or foreigners, Russians um, were trying to become equal, you know, to, to feel equal. Look, we are cultured, we are civilized, and yet you're not accepting us as such. So this raises this resentment, and this is similar to many other countries. This is an algorithm that is at work in pretty much any situation where one culture claims to be higher or claims that the other is lower than itself. And um, then, of course, from this resentment, there comes the idea that, oh, Germans and other Europeans, they are too commercially minded. They are very pragmatic. They only think about money. They are just this Protestant ethics um, as, they, as bad as they can be. You know, they, they are just um, all about money and not about any uh, spiritual life. And there was also the meme about, or the, the underlying um, thought about Teutons um, from the Teutonic Order, who forced true Europeans away from Europe. True Europeans being Russian, Slavic peoples in general. You know, um, so the true Europe was taken over by the Huns, the barbarians, even in the time of the ancient Rome, or in the Teutonic Order, or in the First World War. Germans were the aggressors. They were the fake Europeans, they were false. Uh, so, and since they command us, we need to liberate ourselves. Uh, this means that there were multiple layers and trends. On the one hand, there were the educated elites. In the 19th century, they were separated into um, largely two narratives, the Slavophiles and the Zapadniki, westernizers. Among peasants, there would be the fears of Antichrist coming and taking shape of, a, for example, a Nimitz, and the laughter at ridiculous manners, costumes, etc. 
And because Russia was slowly moving into Siberia, or not so slowly, uh, it was taming the non-Slavic ethnic groups, Russianness became more shaped also against these non-Slavic ethnic groups. Because what we are, our religion, our language, is the civilization, and that's the light of enlightenment that we bring to the other peoples. And this brought a lot of discussions over Russia's own destiny. As I mentioned, the war uh, in 1812 was a key moment in that time, which raised the issues for early Slavophiles and early Zapadniki. Um, now, Admiral Shishkov um, was, of course, not as black as he is often painted, or not as horrible, but he definitely developed this polarized perception of Russia and Europe. He spoke about um, uh, how Russian language needs to be protected, how no new words should be loaned from the Western languages, for example, French, and pretty much Russia should go back to its church Slavic language. And it was the idealized portrayal of Russia, naturally. So what it should be uh, was taken for what it actually is, which it never was. On the other hand, Chadaev and the Zapadniki, uh, who were active in the 1830s, uh, sort of spoke about denying Russian culture any innovative nature. Uh, Chadaev was very critical of the government for closing the country from enlightenment and from progress which were synonymous to Europe. Um, so there is this idealized image of Europe or the West. Uh, moreover, there was this idea of some perfect unified European way, which was about liberty, equality, freedom of enterprise, progress, which of course Europe was not the perfect embodiment of. There is no existing ideal, naturally. Um, and then there was the second round with uh, the two most famous representatives for um, Zapadniki and Slavophiles being Herzen and Homekov. And um, Alexander Herzen, um, he was sometimes called Russian European. He was born in 1812 in Moscow, exactly at the time when the city was burnt to prevent Napoleon uh, coming in. So his family had to run away. He was born to a Russian father out of wedlock by a German um, lady's maid in the house. So he was this uh, bastard child which affected his position in the society and in his own family. And he lived a very tumultuous life. He was banished from Moscow several times in 1830s and 40s. In 1847, he finally managed to emigrate. He lived first in Italy, then in France and Switzerland, and then he settled in Britain. And he died in Paris in 1870. When he was in London, he created, he established the Free Russian Press together with Nikolai Ogarev, who was another revolutionary from Russia. They both emigrated. And they published periodicals Palarna Zvezda, or the Polar Star, and Kolokol, the Bell, which were um, covertly imported into Russia and spread among Russian intellectuals. And um, he was acquainted with Bakunin, Marx, and many other thinkers from the time. He idolized Russian peasants. He had this idea of going to the people, which affected the way Russians, uh, further Russian intelligentsia, uh, thought about what needs to be done. But what is very important, once he moved to Europe, he actually saw that the ideal that he had created for himself in his mind was not there. So he wrote that Europe has parted ways with the perfect and the true way. The true way was of enlightenment, of progress, of liberty and equality, and that was in Renaissance. By the 19th century, Europe became dominated by the bourgeoisie, by the commercially oriented and money-minded classes who were not at all the ideal for Russia. So he sort of thinks in the way that Russian peasants are the carriers who will bring Russia to this true path of equality and liberty and freedom and so on. He was very influential. There is the song about the historic lack of sleep. I will not read it to you. If you want to, I can, I can send it into a chat afterwards. 
uh, is my translation of a Russian text, and it mockingly reproduces the, um, the, you know, the connections between Herzen and Lenin. Um, how it's it's a joking song. Um, how you know um, from Herzen, everything moved further in Russian thinking, uh, in Russian thinking about uh, its own position in the world. However, Herzen was, of course, by far not the only one to think about these matters. There was also Alexei Khomyakov, who was a very important representative of the Slavophiles. Uh, born in 1804, died in 1816. Lezan, he died when he was trying to um, help peasants fight uh, um, an epidemic of cholera. He caught cholera himself and died. Um, so he never saw the reform that was carried out in 1861, where Russia finally parted with the system of serfdom. Uh, but he traveled also to Europe, but only on very brief trips. Herzen actually, once he left Russia in 1847, he never returned. But um, Khomekov always returned to Russia and he traveled to France and to Germany. He participated in the Russo-Turkish War. He was quite active uh, in many spheres of life. And he thought that the West failed to resolve the spiritual problems of humanity and succumbed to the competition and individualism. So if you see, if you notice, this pretty much means that Herzen, the Zapadnik, and Homyakov, the Slavophile, pretty much merged in one in this, that the West has succumbed to some wrong values. However, uh, their attitudes to the peasantry were somehow different, or rather what the peasantry should do. But they both idolized Russian peasants. Uh, I will not go into more detail, just bear in mind that there is this whole narrative uh, between, that there is this whole dispute between Slavophiles and Zapadniki. And then, of course, comes the 20th century and communism. And this changes the whole idea of alliances, because instead of Europe, Russia is now defining itself in opposition to America. And in the 1920s, there were still very strong ideas of world revolution, which means that we do not define ourselves as Russians or French or Germans or Chinese or Czechs or Americans. We define ourselves by our classes. I am a proletariat member. You are the bourgeoisie. Therefore, I have a class hatred to you. Uh, etc. So the alliances were shifting and they also changed during the different wars, the Second World War, Cold War, etc. And yeah, speaking of class struggle, the cover of the book that was one of the readings for one of the previous lectures by Ian Burma and uh, Margalit, the cover for it, I don't think the book mentions it anywhere. I searched and I couldn't find it. Maybe it was a different edition that I have. But um, it's a cartoon by Denny, a Soviet cartoonist from the 1920, and it was satirizing capital. Um, so this is a Soviet cartoonist, sort of representing the Occidentalism here on the cover of the book, inside which there is not a single word about the Soviet Union. I find this rather ironic, but Denny would probably be quite happy with that. Um, in any case, the USSR was the head of the socialist states, um, so it was neither Europe nor Asia, it was the avant-garde of proletariat class. There was no religion anymore but communism, goodbye to orthodoxy. And of course there were the persistent ideals of selflessness and cooperation rather than commerce, which were pretty much inherited from the previous period. So there is a lot of connections uh, between them two. And of course, like I say, in the moments when antagonism between communist and capitalist countries is decreased, suddenly we find cartoons like this. You will remember that I'm big on cartoons. Um, here are the, this is the front cover of Crocodile from 1955. This is from another issue from 1959. Um, Crocodile was eager to publish, um, the magazine was eager to publish cartoons where Soviet and American or Soviet and British flags are right next to each other, we're friends so long as the capitalist governments are not exploiting workers and destroying peace. Um, in the 20th century, there were also a number of thinkers, and I will not go into much detail because I kind of ran out of time. Um, just, I'm sure you have actually heard about Lev Gumilov, uh, who was an important Eurasianist, uh, 
Uh, he was arrested a great number of times. Um, he was the son of the enemy of people, so he was constantly arrested during the Stalin times. Um, after he was finally released in 1956, he, was, he became interested in the nomadic peoples of Central Asia. He worked in the state hermitage in Leningrad or in St. Petersburg today. And he developed a theory of ethnogenesis and passionality of ethnic groups. He considered Russians a sort of super ethnos related to Turkic Mongol peoples of the Eurasian steppe. So Gumilov kind of um, describes the tendencies in a very peculiar way. Uh, he is considered somewhat um, unhealthily manipulative in his uh, dealing with history by historians. But he was nevertheless very influential for the Russian thinkers, those who dealt with the idea of whether or not Russia is the West or the East. Um, he, um, uh, this is similar to what uh, Schimmel Penning writes, again in the introduction and conclusion, if you read those. Um, another one, a uh, far less influential or far less respectable person, is Alexander Dugin. He is still alive, mm, uh, very much so. Uh, he was born in 1962, and he became a sort of um, speaker for Putin's regime during the um, early 2010s, when his theory of Russia as heartland, opposing Atlanticism, or US-led West, um, um, this theory became very convenient for what Russian politics were at the time. And this sort of peculiar philosophy, he considers himself a philosopher, not an ideologist of the regime, um, it was based on the general disappointment that the whole nation, the whole Russian uh, society was feeling the, the, this massive disappointment with both communism and liberalism, democracy, and all that it stands for. By 2010s, that was a very strong feeling in Russia. And I will come to my conclusion here um, Russia's identity, I think, remains very problematic, both for Russia itself and for the other countries. Um, in the periods of reconciliation with the West, we suddenly become far more pro-European, we feel ourselves European. When antagonism drives us apart, the mainstream opinions are more towards Eurasianism or special path. Russia has a special path that it follows. We have a special truth. It, it's based on the fact that Russia actually does have, through its history, mixed origins, mixed political creeds, and somewhat mixed religious stance, because of course Russia today is by far not only the um, Orthodox Christians, there is a lot of Islam and Buddhist uh, believers, and so on and so forth. So Russia as the West feels itself as the West when confronted with Asia, and it feels itself to be the East when disappointed in Western counterparts. And I will finish here, and I hope that you could hear and see everything well enough. Thank you for the attention.